Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first panel. We'll then hear from Senator Menendez, and then we'll have a lunch break. Uh, can I ask other panel members to come up? In the meantime, uh, I'll introduce uh, Russell Robinson, who Effie already introduced as a CEO of uh, JNF here in America. Uh, we have uh, Jerusalem Post columnist Martin Sherman sitting next to me, businessman and philanthropist Matthew Bronfman, and <laughs> Rita, you're here. <laughs> Welcome. And Ido Aroni, Israel's Consul General in New York. Rita, we've heard a lot of men speak this, uh, this morning, so I'm going to start with you. Uh, before am I, you. Am I the first woman? You're the first woman. And uh, the only? <laughs> so far, the only woman. <laughs> you have a whole philosophy about music and peace. Tell us about right, it. Right, right. First, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Rita, and uh, I don't know if everyone knows, I was born in Iran, Tehran. And uh, my mother, I think she's the reason for my love of music and singing. Mother had a beautiful, warm voice, and uh, being a singer back then in Iran was inappropriate. So we had her singing fill up our home while she was cooking or cleaning the house. She used to snap her fingers. It's a Persian uh, <laughs> thing. Yeah. She used to snap her fingers to the rhythm and sing old and new songs. And one of my first memories is uh, my mother sitting on the carpet, stretching her legs forward, placing a pillow uh, uh, on her legs. She used to, and me on the pillow in front of her, she used to rock me and sing lullabies. And through the years, she, she sang in our family gatherings and uh, family celebrations. Um, when I was eight years old, uh, I moved to Israel with my family, and for the very first time, I experienced a completely different culture. <laughs> yeah, while the Iranian uh, mentality is covered layers by layers, revealing some, but keeping most hidden, the Israeli mentality is open, uh, free, cheeky, immediate. But the funny and the sad thing was that when we lived in Iran, we lived in a Muslim neighborhood, so my parents forbade us to say that we are Jewish. And when I came to Israel, I instantly became the girl who were mocked for being Persian. It was lose-lose situation, that's it. Uh, and yet today you're very popular in Iran, apparently. <laughs> uh, my, my, um, my childhood dream was to be a singer, and I practiced, learned, practiced, uh, uh, developed my, my skills as well as broadening uh, all forms of art. Is it okay that I'm talking so much? Uh, we want, we do want. Huh? <laughs> it's fine, but we do want to give other people okay, a chance. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> so I, I can stop telling and then do it. And too. carry later, carry on later, and we and we're also going to hear Rita sing for us later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ido Aroni, do you want to pick up from here and tell us how you see culture and music as being a part of Israel's? battle against uh, delegitimization? Well, I think it's appropriate that you asked me to speak right after Rita, because <laughs> I, think, I think she is, she is exactly, she is the embodiment of what we need to do. She serves as the bridge between cultures, peoples, ethnicities, um, religions, and the fact that her album that was produced in Farsi is doing great in Iran proves my point. Now, we made a terrible mistake as a nation, as a collective. It's not too late to fix that mistake. But the mistake that we made is one of historical proportions. It's the main reason why we're underperforming so severely in areas such as investment, tourism, 
exchange of students. We're doing poorly. We're attracting only 1,500 American students to Israel every year instead of 30 and 40 and 50,000 American students. And the reason is because we defined ourselves to the world only in terms of our problems. Now I can tell you here, and I want every person here to think about it for a second. There is no precedent for a place, a city, a country, a nation, a company, a brand that did well, prospered by discussing its problems alone. And that's exactly what the State of Israel did for 66 years. So it's time for us as a collective, as a nation, to begin a long-term celebration of our assets. Rita is a great asset, but we have many assets. It's time for us to adopt the language of Israel's relative advantages. And we have so many of them. We are a bastion of creativity and innovation and a reason for inspiration for the entire world. Russell Robinson, I'm sure you connect with what Ido Aroni just said. So I will add to it and, and, and uh, amplify it. I think when Effie Stenzler talks about a 12,500 seat amphitheater in Beersheba, that's a wow. It's a large entertainment venue. When you listen to Nir Barkat speak, what was the pictures that he showed? What was it that really got us energized was those pictures of a concert in Sultan's Pool. The energy was when he showed the light show in Yerushalayim, when he showed the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the jogging, running, I don't do it, so. Um, Formula One. Formula One. That's the point, is that that's how we have to talk about Israel. We can talk about Israel as a place that uh, an Iranian Jew can come to a neighborhood and have problems because they were Iranian and they're not uh, from uh, um, an Ashkenazi country. You could have those kind of discussions. What we cannot have discussions is constantly talking about Israel not going to exist. I have to tell you, it's very hard to sell a product if I want to sell you an iPad and tell you, please purchase it, but I don't know if Apple will be in business. Let's talk about that we're going to be in business and buy the greatest product around Israel. Matthew Bronfman, this seems like a logical, a logical time for you to step in. Is that the way to sell Israel? Well, that's certainly one of the ways to sell Israel. Uh, Israel is going to be here forever, God willing. And, um, and, and as the mayor said, with uh, United Jerusalem forever, um, I, I, I think one, I, was a, I was asked a few years ago, um, how do you get more Americans to invest in Israel? And I said, I think you're asking the wrong question. So the question is, how do you get more Americans to fall in love with Israel? And the way to fall in love is simply to go. And I think that some of the programs that have been set up, you know, starting with Birthright and many others that encourage young American Jews to go to Israel, then it's impossible, in my view, not to fall in love with Israel. And once you fall in love, then everything else is possible, whether it's investing or just visiting cultural events. That is the way to get Americans to fall in love with Israel and to help protect Israel as we go forward. All right. Effie, that gelled very well with what you told us earlier, falling in love with Israel, bringing more people to Israel. Um, is that what JNF KKL sees its future role? Yes, together with uh, JNF United States, together with Nefesh Benefesh, we are now uh, making all the efforts to bring as much as more we can bring people, youngsters from here, from United States, from Canada, to Israel, and to settle them in the Negev and Galil. Without the Negev and Galil, without to strengthen them, we will lose Tel Aviv area. That was Ben Gurion said 50 years ago. That what we are have to do now, and together with the, those of wonderful organization, that what we are doing. And I hope that we will have more and more. For example, uh, the last aeroplane that came to Israel brought with him 600 youngsters that voluntary as. Um, Chayal Boded, as lonely soldiers, are going to Israel to work with the IDF to serve the Israeli country, to serve the Israeli state. 
Martin Sherman, because I know you, do you want to play a devil's advocate here? Well, I, I, was, I was going to say I don't want to rain on everyone's parade, but I think sometimes we get carried away by um, stressing Israel's great achievements. And I, I don't mean that cynically, because in many ways today for me, Israel is like a, a bus where people are investing in the upholstery and putting in Wi-Fi and improving the, 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 stereo, uh, the stereo system, but they're forgetting to maintain the engine and take care of the brakes. And uh, you know, I think it would be a bit unrealistic and uh, unreasonable to fly me across a continent and an ocean and expect me not to mention the Palestinian issue, even in a session which is headlined the socioeconomic uh, challenges. Okay, briefly. <laughs> because, because I think overlying and overshadowing all the socioeconomic issues that you can uh, think of is the Palestinian issue. You cannot plan rationally and intelligently any socioeconomic issue, whether it's your air contacts with the world, the, the ground transport system, your housing system, ecology, tourism, none of those can be planned in a long-term fashion rationally unless you have some idea of how the Palestinian issue is going to play out. Whether you want to have a unilateral withdrawal or a unilateral annexation, etc., etc., all that impacts crucially on all those socioeconomic issues. Rita, what do you have to say to that? I, I first, what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think how to, um, to tell um, to everyone my story because I'm a, I'm a live uh, example for something that I think we can use. And I, I'll, I'll try to explain that. Um, when I was eight, my childhood dream was to be a singer. And um, throughout the years, I had the privilege to perform on the most amazing and exciting stages in Israel and over the world. I think the, the most memorable um, highlight was singing the anthem of, of Israel in Jerusalem. And I couldn't forget uh, the, the eight-year-old child who made an aliyah from Iran. Um, when I, um, uh, two years ago, I had this burning urge to record a um, um, Persian album, uh, the songs that were the soundtrack of my family life. And I had no idea, sorry that I'm telling, it will be connect, it, it will connect everything together, okay? Wow. Because you have to go uh, through, some, through some journey to understand what I'm trying, and why it's so important for me to be here and, and to speak what I, what I have to speak. Um, to, to, uh, and I, I had no idea that uh, what influence this culture has on so many things, how rich, spectacular, and amazing uh, the, the Persian culture is. Until I started researching it, interviewing my parents, uh, beginning with the influences of uh, math, architecture, and ending with rhymes, uh, harmonies, instruments, and, uh, and even the language. Um, when I told my, my friends and colleagues that I'm going to do an entire record in Persian, they were amazed. They <laughs> asking me, are you, are, you, are you insane? A whole record in Ahmadinejad's language? <laughs> Who would want to listen to that? You, you, you are risking your career, aren't you afraid? Well, I suppose I didn't care and I couldn't imagine that this intimate uh, project will affect so much like a stone thrown to a lake, creating you know, ripples constantly growing. Uh, first came the Israeli acceptance, which was amazing because of the, of the, of the Persian uh, language, because of the negative context of the Persian language. Uh, Again, music proved to be a connecting thread. 
But the most amazing uh, responses came from the Iranian, from Iran. And responses as such as uh, from the internet, you know, they, they wrote, thank you for showing the true colors of our beautiful culture, or thank you for showing us a side of threat and, um, and hate. Uh, we love you and we love your country and we don't want anything bad happen to both of you. Uh, one particular very cute person wrote that he would rather, uh, uh, if the punishment even would be uh, to, to go to three years jail and 70 whiplashes, he would still rather to come and to see the concert. Uh, so uh, a National Geographic, a, a, Wall Street, uh, a Wall Street National research uh, discovered that uh, my album is a big hit in uh, Iran and that it has been sold in the black Iranian market uh, under the tables, and uh, they hear it in their cars, in their homes, in their family gatherings. So in my recent um, performance, in my recent tour, I'm, I'm singing Hebrew and Persian naturally intertwined with each other. Uh, and a year ago, I had the honor to deliver this uh, performance. Uh, with the help of the amazing courage and dreaming Ron Prosor. Thank you very much. We need a lot of people like you, leaders who can dream and, and, and uh, think about those things. Uh, I had the privilege to perform uh, on the UN's uh, main assembly hall uh, as a gesture of goodwill of the Israeli delegation. And uh, before going on stage to uh, giving his remarks and uh, introducing me, uh, Secretary, Gen Ge Secretary, uh, Ge Secretary General Assembly, no, no, Secretary Ban Ki-moon, yeah, I'm sorry. I have to, uh, <laughs> to say it in Hebrew and then to English. Uh, no, first he, Persian, and then no, no. I'm, jo I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, uh, we had a, a we had time to to chat a little, and not before I I forced him to show me the the moves or uh, the authentic moves of Gangnam Style. Uh, he's good good in it, but but then seriously, he said that um, that art has a great role in our world to connect between people and uh, not to take this lightly uh, that both being Iranian and Israeli, I can use that and especially a woman to, to connect between those two countries and that many revolutions started with music, a place that uh, politicians cannot enter. I had two choices. I'm, I swear I will stop. I had two choices to stay in my comfortable zone and uh, continue singing and to do, sing to my people and to my country or to use my personal journey, per, an artistic journey to, to connect between the two countries. Two months ago, uh, Mr. Shimon Peres, the president called me and talked with me, yes, yes, the, the amazing, and, and uh, he talked to me about this issue and he said, well, if the Iranian don't want to talk to us, we will sing to them. <laughs> and that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Ido Aoni, we're gonna hear from Ambassador Prosor in our next panel, but what do you think about Rita's point? Can she spark a revolution? I, I, I totally agree with her. And to go back to what Martin said, um, you know, a lot of people know here what I stand for. Uh, it has to be said very clearly. Um, I never suggested to ignore the Palestinian conflict. On the contrary, we should deal with it, and should we, we should deal with it um, aggressively, and uh, we should manage the crisis. 
Um, but they, it doesn't mean that Israel, given the fact that we live in a very difficult neighborhood and we are experiencing constantly some geopolitical hardships, it doesn't mean that Israel cannot do better. Israel can do much better. Take the example of Spain, another country that experiences a wide range of problems, became a tourism magnet. 60 million tourists a year go to Spain. Take the example of Turkey, hmm. a country that has several conflicts to deal with. Ethnic, they have a, their own problem of terrorism. The number of tourists that visit Turkey a year is larger than the number of tourists that come to Israel, I'm sorry, a month, is larger than the number of tourists that come to Israel in a year. They get five and a half million tourists a month. Israel should be attracting 10, 15, 20 million tourists a year. And the main reason that we're underperforming so severely is because we constantly talk about our problems and not our advantages. And this has to change. But, Ido, uh, don't you think we do have an image problem? Why don't we use people like Rita to improve our image? I, I couldn't agree more, and that's exactly what we do. My dear colleague here, Ron Passore, had this great idea, uh, the UN. I told Rita the other day when we met, her performance at the UN is only the beginning of her international exposure and international journey. Martin, what is your response? Well, let me, let me pick up on, on what, you say, what you said. I don't think it's, not, uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, only uh, presenting our strong side and ignoring our problems. I think we have to talk about solving our problems as well. And I think, I think talking about managing them rather than solving them, we're doing ourselves a, a disservice. And as you mentioned tourism, for, for example, going back to what I said earlier, I think the whole tourist industry in Elat is on a knife edge. Four or five more rocket attacks on, this, on, the, on the city, and uh, hopefully there won't be any casualties, but if there are, uh, the, the, the location will be taken off the books on the, the, uh, the, 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 the tour manager, managers. So I, I think that this, you, have to, you have to really, if we're talking about uh, socioeconomic challenges, we have to address the Palestinian issue in its entirety. Tom Friedman recently wrote an article about, uh, a biased article, a misleading article, about the problems of uh, pollution from a tannery in, in Hebron. Uh, so it depends who's going to control the ecological system. Uh, there's the question of uh, uh, carcinogenic pollution from uh, charcoal burning by the Palestinians, which you need to know who's going to control that. There's the question of where you can build houses and, and the influence on the housing market. Bottom you, line, well, what's the bottom line here? So, as, I, as I, was, I was saying again, we need not to talk about our problems as problems, but we need to talk about solutions for the problems in order to bolster our, our uh, attraction to the elderly. Uh, we have time for one comment each because Senator Menendez has uh, got a tight schedule. Matthew, um, your final comments. Um, you know, the, the panel was about socioeconomic issues facing Israel, um, and there are some. There's no question that there are some challenges, uh, but one of the things about Israel is that there's a rule of law, and there is a way to deal with so many of our problems uh, in, a, in a politically, economically viable way. My biggest concern is that, that uh, Israel today is overregulated. Uh, it affects us in our, in our business all the time. Um, and I think that we need to understand how to, we need to figure out how to get foreigners to come and invest in Israel, and the overregulation is, is one of the issues that I think is getting in the way. Thank you. Effie Stenzel. You know, social justice began in the Bible time. And for example, what uh, JNF KKL is doing, as we saw, we planted more than 240 million trees more than 1,000 parks and forests crossing all over Israel. All of them are open 365 days a year without to pay any penny from the citizens or from the tourism. Number two, we are not getting any penny from the Israeli government. Everything is our Jewish money supporter from all over the world since the last 100 years, and thanks God, to the next 1,000 years. Three. What we are doing in the Negev and Galil is making a better place for those people. And this will make the 
um, let's say the prices of the uh, of of buildings in Israel going down because if we will have better place in the Negev in Galil, Tel Aviv will be not so high uh, prices and it will be low price in the Negev, not because it's in the end of the world, but because it's the center, will become the center of education, of culture for Israelis and all over the world. Russell Robinson. So I think that uh, my fear is always when people talk about the social economic issues of Israel and they talk about it from the Palestinian uh, conflict. It is real and it is not to be ignored, but it is also, but it is also not to cause a paralysis of action. And too often, both on regulations and on other issues, it becomes our paralysis. At the end of the day, there's a governmental decisions and it's the solution by the people of Israel that will elect or not elect or what they have as their leadership in those issues. But I have to tell you, the difference between Israel is not to have a paralysis for the frontier, the Negev and the Galil, not to have a paralysis that takes care of issues of Yoraham and Demona and Beit Shan because we are dealing only with the uh, Palestinian issue. We have to deal with the borders of which we have and deal with the people within there. And I say that our, our country, our nation of Israel, is a nation of 14 and a half million Jews, seven million which live within its borders. That's a nice place to end. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, unfortunately, we have to cut it off to allow Senator Menendez to speak. Thank you very much.